Hey, uh, Lent is, has been seven weeks long, and we've followed Jesus for seven weeks through seven conversations, and now it's finally, like, Lent is coming to an end, the series is coming to an end, all your questions about God and all that, check it off, we're going to just do them all right here. Isn't that exciting? Well, we might not get all your questions, but, um, but I'm going to a ministry conference next week, so I'm going to be gone for a couple Sundays, so you should be excited that we have two really cool guest preachers come in the next couple of weeks. At least that's exciting to me. Um, but, but to set the scene, so not everyone, as, as, as you said, not everyone's been here all seven weeks. I don't know if anyone's been here all seven weeks, but it's, Daniel's been here all seven weeks. <laughs> I've been here all seven weeks. Uh, thank, thank goodness Daniel's been here all seven weeks. And it's, it, it's, kind, of, it's kind of led us somewhere. Um, honestly, this, this April, the, the Sunday after Easter is International Youth Pastor Preaching Day. Uh, all around the world, churches, the, 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 the real pastor gets you know, the Sunday off, and then, and then the youth pastor gets up there and says something scandalous. And unfortunately, because of the way the stories go, it's always about doubt. And so you know, the youth pastor gets to get up there and say, oh, it's great to doubt. I've preached this sermon so many times, like the doubt sermon, that it bores me. I'm going to fall asleep up here. So I wanted to just set this in new context with the seven weeks that we've been experiencing so, so that I don't fall asleep up here. So first, ages ago... We saw Jesus hanging out, talking with the tempter. That was, that's that's the, the technical word there. Some of us think of it as the devil or the Satan or whatever it might be. But the word there is the tempter. And the tempter is trying to convince Jesus and trying to convince us that there is a division in our world. There's all this spiritual and religious and meaningful stuff over here. And then all the, our regular everyday life over here. And never the twain shall meet. And a lot of us live that way, subconsciously. Maybe we make choices to, to kind of buy into that idea, and we live six days a week like this, and we live one hour a week like this, whatever it is. A lot of us in the world buy into this division. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. The deepest parts of our lives, whatever you call that, your purpose, God, faith, whatever you call it, that's just all mixed up together with the normal things in your life, like breakfast and driving and annoying family members and... All those things are just jammed together. Jesus started his ministry, and and we started our whole Lenten practice with this counter idea. That if anyone is going to grow into new life, whatever that means, they don't need to accept this idea, but it's going to help a lot. If you you accept that life and faith are somehow holistic rather than compartmentalized. And and actually, there was a line in, in Will's beautiful song there. There was one line that had bad theology. There's one line in there where he's saying, uh, Jesus has risen. We don't say on Easter, Jesus has risen, because Jesus, whatever that verb form is, it's like, it happened over there, okay, ho-hum, we can move on, do our life separately. What we say on Easter morning is, he is risen. He is risen. God is part of our lives. The messy, the beautiful, all that stuff mingled together. And that's hopeful, and that's helpful, because the second week, we stumbled across this woman, we called her Samantha, the Samaritan woman, uh, we might call her today spiritual but not religious. And when she saw, when she started to discover that all this everyday stuff in her life mattered to Jesus, when her junk that she carries around every day in her thoughts and in the back of her mind, when she realized that mattered to God, that was an open door to the possibility that all the hurt and the confusion and the emptiness, that might not be all there is to who she is. The world isn't the kind of place where uh, some people are over here that they do the right things and they believe the right things and God loves them. And these people over here, well, they just don't do it all right. And so they might be ignored by God or punished by God. A lot of us have felt like we're over here. But Samantha learns from Jesus, and that's not really how it is. God cares about all the stuff in everybody's life, and you're in everybody, and you've got stuff, so you must matter to God. The third week, we watched someone else. We called him Nick. And we watched him, we might classify him as religious, but not so spiritual. We've known people like this. And, and he discovered that God actually cares about him in ways he never could have conceived. He thought he was supposed to follow rules and order. And he found out that God works even in the messed up parts of his life. And that doesn't mean that, uh, that he has to start going to church more. I don't know what Nick did, but he probably didn't like, take this little realization and just start giving more time or money. or He didn't necessarily just start reading the Bible every day. Those are all great things, but that wasn't the, the necessary uh, follow-up to him starting to grow with Jesus. He, he just had a spark of a new way of thinking, of a new way of living, of a new way of feeling about God. And at the very least, that little spark took him out of his rut. 
It got him unstuck. And if any of us have ever been stuck, always behind, never fulfilled, never satisfied, there's a path to new life through that realization. So, so, so then in the next week, the fourth week, this one's going to be hard for some of you who come to church a lot um, because you come to church a lot. It, it's amazing, but we found out in there that things can change, things can grow, even in church. I know. That's crazy. We, 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 we saw how churches in this story, that story weeks ago, can change even despite, or maybe even because of the silly arguments that happen in churches. And this is hard to swallow, one of those hard to swallow Bible lessons like talking snakes and talking donkeys and all that. But we've been to churches where change? We did that in 1972. We're not going to do that again. We know how that went. <laughs> We've been to churches, some of us have been to churches, some of us have been part of churches, some of us have been the victims of churches where uh, it embarrasses the body of Christ how they treat people. We have been to churches that I know they mean well, but it seems like everything that they do, the, the rules they set, the rules they break, the leaders they trust, the leaders who violate, the messages that they give that are antiquated and hollow, it's like they're just trying to cut down the cross all the time. But in this story, we saw that when people start to figure out what Jesus is about, God's spirit moves here still. Even when they argue uh, about who to help or how to help or how that's going to glorify God, and this, whether you're on session or whether you're just interacting with me one-on-one -on -one after this stuff, if we don't disagree once in a while, we're probably not talking about stuff that's important enough. If we aren't having some time where we're going to argue about what this means or why that matters, you know, we're, we're just shallow. We're just... Kind of hanging out together with some patina of relationship. But God's Spirit moves here still. And if it can happen in the church, fifth week we saw how new life can even happen in your life, even in the darkest places. That no matter how dead you feel, you aren't alone in trying to push away the things that hold you back from abundance and from fulfillment. We learned, did Lazarus roll the stone away himself or did God roll the stone? We learn that you don't have to do all that work by yourself. You don't have to deal with your addictions by yourself. You don't have to deal with conflict by yourself. You don't have to find all the courage all on your own because God puts people in your life that roll away stones in the right time and with divine sympathy. You might find a glimpse of the new life that is there. There's not a tomb in the world that you can't come out of with God's help. And on Palm Sunday... Weather was terrible. You think this is bad. Weather was terrible on Palm Sunday, so we had very few people here to hear kind of a, you know, some cool music, and it was, it was chaotic, and that was kind of the message of finding hope in the chaos. And Jesus came to Jerusalem, and everyone's happy, and there's smiling children, and there's waving palms, and there's smiling donkeys, and there's all these great, happy things. I don't know if the donkeys smile. Can donkeys smile? I don't know. Like a neigh or something. But, but they're all happy, and then all of a sudden, like in a moment, it just turned. And life got dark, and life got uh, upside down, and the future looked hopeless, and death seemed inevitable. New life. I mean, the disciples, all they wanted to do was get out of there alive. His best friends were just trying to get out of there alive. This wasn't a learning experience. This was real life falling apart through their hands. And we had been there. One moment. One conversation, one doctor's visit, one phone call, one storm in our lives. Man, why, why did I say that? If that one word, if that one sentence hadn't come out of my mouth, my whole life could have been so different. One moment and your life is breaking apart. It, it, when that happens, where do you get bearing? How, how can you possibly plan for tomorrow when everything is crashing down today? And somewhere through that chaos, we heard that hope finds a way. So then Easter, we've come through so much to get to Easter, to get to the, to the white up there. We've grown with these people, these seven different conversations, and we've, we've watched those conversations kind of track us towards something powerful. And at the climax of this story, Mary is standing there, and she says, I have seen the Lord. I've come through, I've come through openness, I've come through change, I've come through relationships, and I've come through pain and chaos and despair, and I have seen the Lord. I have seen that evil will not get the last word. I have seen that God will rise up. I have seen the Lord. I can't understand it, but I can feel it, that God is working here in our hearts. I have seen the Lord, and now week eight, Thomas says, eh, 
I don't know. I mean, there's something special about that guy. and He probably has something to do with God. He, he's probably really tight with God. Maybe he can even make my life a little bit better if I, if I do something. But until I see it, until, until I can see joy coming out of hopelessness, until I can you know, see it and feel it and measure it and prove it and touch it, I'm just not sure it's going to work for me. Because you know, my situation's a little different than those seven situations. And you know, God hasn't written a story just for me yet. And Thomas says, I'm, there's got to be something about those seven weeks that works for you. But for me, isn't it a slippery slope? We went from the possibility of a uh, little idea about the possibility of new life to the actuality, that's a big gap. And p- part of Thomas is just filled with questions, good old honest questions. Why does God work that way? You know, it's, why faith journeys? Why not just fix it? Why transitions? Why not just start it out in the right way? Why not just fix the world and all of its problems and let's move on? And why not just, you know, if, you, if you're not going to fix it, God... How am I supposed to fix it? How am I supposed to fix myself uh, when I'm, I, I'm, I'm broken enough? How am I even going to find you know, living water? That was one of the things hiding behind these conversations. And, and, and rolling away stones, I have no idea how that works. Another part of Thomas, I think, has this gnawing just doubt. Is God real at all? I mean, I, he's been hanging out with God incarnate for three years. And yet, don't you get the sense he's still just a little... Uh, I don't know. If, if God is real, is God on my side or her side or our side? But when I look at all the junk in the world, I mean, I can turn the paper or maybe I'll turn it to this page or that page. When I read some of that stuff, I'm just not so sure. Thomas, God bless him, he just lays it all on the table, stuff that kind of gnaws and bubbles up in our lives. There's just something fishy here, and I want answers. And don't you want answers too? It's the most natural thing in the world, a curious faith. And, and, and don't you appreciate that Thomas, right after the most dramatic story, maybe in the history of the whole world, he just hedges his bets. You can relate to that. I, I had this guess that someone, uh, maybe Daniel's been sitting there his seven weeks, and anyone else who's been sitting there seven weeks has thought, well, that makes sense, but I'm just not sure about that. I, or, or I've nodded along all seven weeks thinking, yeah, that, that's good, that's good, that's good, but uh, the whole picture... I don't know, I still want more answers about God and faith and church and how it affects you and why you matter to that whole story. So here's what we're going to do. Anyone who has questions, there's green cards in your pews. And I want you to take those green cards and I want you to find some writing device. And If you had five minutes just to hang out with Jesus, or if you had five minutes to hang out with me, easier question, just come and ask me a question. If there's just something you don't understand about what the church says, maybe about these, these thick biblical words like forgiveness or sin or heaven or whatever that is, you know, just, just write them down. And it might be about just the Bible. It might be about your calling. It might be about love. It might be about how on earth you're ever going to find the strength to do this or to do that. Just write them down. The ushers are going to collect them. Maybe Daniel, can, can you noodle a little bit while they're writing? We'll take like a minute. And uh, when you're done writing, you're going to hand them in. And then you're going to chat with your neighbors. And they're going to just kind of share. Share your questions with each other. If you've got answers, share them. If you don't have answers, just appreciate each other's questions. Let's go ahead and write.
to make a little distinction. I used two separate words there. I said share each other some answers. I said share each other some replies. And when Thomas had faith and when Thomas had doubt, he received an answer. He got to put his fingers right where he, he asked a question, he got to answer right away. Some of our questions, we get answers that way. Is it A, B, C, or D? It's C, relief. I wish I could just have relief. Sometimes we get that. Other times, we have a concern, we have a worry about, about faith or about life or about anything, and the best we can do is struggle through a reply. Just something that works for now. Right? We, we, we see the difference there? In that case, is it A, B, C, or D? Well, I don't know. A, a has a little merit, and, and B makes a little sense to me, and I don't understand C at all, but that lady over there, I really like her, and she thinks C, so there might be something to it. And D seems about the worst answer in the world, but, you know, I've changed my mind before. And, and I talked to that guy over there. He thinks in ways I can't even wrap my brain around. Everything he's talking about is E or F or Z or purple or whatever, but it sure sounds interesting, and maybe there's something to that. So, so, you know, doubt and questions are so normal, so valuable, no matter where we are on our faith journey. And having a variety of spiritual replies from friends and from church and from brilliant people we read, that's, man, that's part of life and growth and strength. And whether you fall into a category like we talked about weeks ago, spiritual, not religious, religious, not spiritual, you have a church home you're disappointed in, or you want a church home, or if you fall into a category of, of, of just Easter people, just absolutely loving God with tenacity and trust, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, those diverse replies will move us to new life. If you don't have any good questions, go get some. If, if you're at the point in your life like Thomas, you know, where you are struggling with doubt, all I can tell you is what Jesus told him. Now, after he wrestled with his doubt with his friends for a week, Jesus came and said, Peace be with you. May the wonders of your soul find a peaceful reply from the Spirit of God. Amen.